some of God's best people began to abandon the very calling placed by Jesus himself. And of course, we know that Peter is one of those men. We meet him in this kind of a moment in John chapter 21. So if you're not already there, turn there. And as we turn to John 21, I think it's important for us to ask ourselves, what's going on with Peter at this point in his life? Let's look at the text. Begin reading with me in verse 1. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And he manifested himself in this way. They were, there were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of, Ga of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will also come with you. And they went out and got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Therefore Jesus said to them, Children, do you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. They cast, therefore, and they were not, then, then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. That disciple, therefore, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. And so when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about a hundred yards, dragging the net full of fish. And so when they got out upon the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid, and fish placed on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave them and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And so when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had also leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is this one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore, this saying went out among the brethren that the disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. Now, the central part of this, this whole chapter is in verses 15 through 19 when Jesus three times questioned John. I mean, I questioned Peter. Now, you've been in church long enough to know that there are four Greek words that are translated into English as love. The first one is eros. 
but she talks about physical love. This is the word, this is the root word for where we get the word erotic. The second word is thelos. This is, this is translated love into English, but it really means uh, it's used to express a strong desire or a strong wish. Actually, it's no S on it, it's just thelo. It's a strong wish or a strong desire. I just love french fries. Or, man, I would love it if somebody invited Jamie and I out for steak supper tomorrow night. <laughs> Maybe you didn't hear that. I would just love it if somebody invited Jamie and I out for steak supper tomorrow night. Well, I got some in the So, so that is Thilo. The third one is phileo. Phileo is used to express brotherly love. This is the root word for where we get the the name of the town, Philadelphia which is, is their nickname is the city of brotherly love. But then the fourth Greek word is agape, which is the highest form of love. It is a, considered to be a, a, it's not an emotional response, it's volitional, it's a commitment. It's a, it's a love that you have regardless. It's often the most uh, often used word of God's love to us. But when we agape someone else, it's saying that, you, that, that it's a choice that I'm making to care for you, to, to provide for you, to, to love you no matter what. I hope that you've experienced agape love. But those are the four words Greek words that, are, that translate as love. Now, that's important to know at this particular point because of what the conversation is that Jesus has with Peter. It took a while for me to catch on to this, and we don't see it in English. But in, if you go back to the Greek and you look at that, Peter is, I mean, Jesus is asking Peter in verse 15, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter's answer is, yes, Lord, I phileo you. He asked a second time in verse 16, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter answers, Yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. Now, is, is Jesus trying to ratchet up the level of commitment that Peter has? Possibly. But that falls to pieces in verse 17, because in verse 17, Jesus asked, Peter, do you phileo me? And Peter answers, you know I do. Now, obviously he wasn't trying to ratchet up the commitment, so it's just like Jesus to lower the bar, lower the bar of, a commi of commitment, right? <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, just as wrong as it can be. I've never known Jesus to lower the bar of commitment. And interesting enough, he doesn't do that here either. In fact, Jesus did raise the bar of commitment. Not only for Peter, but for all of us. Now, because you see sometimes, not often, but sometimes phileo and agape are used interchangeably. Now, to be fair to Peter, Peter may be saying something along these lines. Lord, it's not just the volitional commitment of my heart. We've been together now for three years. We're bonded. You're like a brother to me, Lord. And this goes deep with me. I love you unconditionally and forever. That may be very much what Peter said. But three times he was asked by Jesus, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Now, it's often been said by a lot of people that he asked three times because Peter denied him three times. I have absolutely no idea whether that's true or not. I mean, the facts are true. He asked three times. Peter did deny him three times, but was that the reason? I don't know. But I do know in questioning Peter three times about his love for him, Jesus is preparing Peter for the first of two truths contained in this message. And that's what, and in this passage, and this is what I want you to see tonight. If we...
Agape Jesus. Not just love Him, but I love Him with, with everything that we have. If we agape Jesus, then we are going to care about what Jesus cares about. Now, when, in verse 15, when Peter said, Lord, you know I love you, what did Jesus say to him? In 15. In 15. He said, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. What did he say in verse 16? Um, Tend my sheep. What did he say in verse 17? What's he saying then? He's saying, he's saying three times so that we don't miss the point. If you love me, you will care about what I care about. Feed my sheep. What's he talking about? He's talking about people. The same people that cause so much problem for us. And he's talking about feeding them. And more than feeding them, he's talking about giving, their, giving to their needs, giving to their nourishment. What kind of feeding is he talking about? Is he talking about physical feeding? Is he talking about physical feeding? I think he's talking about both. If he's hungry, yes. Is he talking about spiritual feeding? Yes. Is he talking about emotional feeding? Well, He's talking about whatever they need. Yeah. Feed the people. Now, which people is he talking about? He's talking about the ones that's always getting in our way. The ones that seem to make our skin crawl. The ones that, who seem, at least in our mind, seem to be the source of, of uh, all of our discouragement and all of our disappointments. In other words, we're to love our friends. We're to love our family. But Jesus told us also love, my, love our enemies. People. We, if, we, if we agape Jesus, at, let me ask you a question. Do you agape Jesus? You love Jesus with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might? With all, that's the greatest commandment. Do you do it? If we do, then we're going to care about what Jesus cares about. Can we be an island? Can we be by ourselves? and just worry about ourselves and take care of ourselves, and still be sold out, committed Christian to Jesus Christ? No. Three times, Jesus told him, in one form or another, feed my sheep. Take care of my people. You, gotta, you and I have to remember that when Jesus came here, when he was living on this earth, he was passionately addicted to one commodity on this planet. And what was he addicted to? People. People. You know, did you ever hear him say, or did you ever read, you know, since Judas was the uh, treasurer, Judas, how much money have we got in the treasury? You know, look at, look at that nice piece of land over there. Why don't we go buy it and build some messianic library so that after I'm gone, all the people will remember me? Did he do anything like that? Absolutely not. But he was always into people, the needs, the nourishment of people. He made blind see. He caused the lame to walk. He caused the deaf to hear. He was always into people. And he's saying when he tells Peter and he tells us to tend his sheep, he's saying, Peter, I will know that you love me when you care about other people. When you care about what I care about, then I will know. Now, how do, how do, you, how do we know that, how, that God loves us? Has he ever demonstrated that love to us some way? He told us. Has he ever demonstrated it? Yes. Okay, you said yes. Tell me how. Why did you say Jesus or Peter? No, it's Jesus. Jesus we, Actually, God. He died on the cross. Absolutely. Romans 5, 8. God demonstrated his love in this way that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Is it enough to say I love you? All right, Lawanda, we'll put you on the spot. Uh, no. <laughs> 
Yeah, that look on your face. <laughs> Don't be tricking me. I'm not tricking you. I'm not tricking you, but it's confession time. Do you like for Johnny to tell you that he loves you? Yeah. Johnny, it's a good opportunity. <laughs> but do you like more when he shows you that he loves you? Is it enough? Just to, is it just enough for him to say, "I love you"? No, he's got to show you. Got to show you. Yeah. Well, that's what God did. He not only told us; He showed it. And what Jesus is telling us here: Show me. If we agape Jesus, we will care about what Jesus cares about. You know, that's how He's going to know. When Jesus was here on this earth. When he came the first time, he spent most of his time with all... Who did he spend most of his time with? Why, it was with all the religious folks, right? He spent all his time with all the authorities, all the leaders, all the pastors and the priests, right? Nope. No, of course not. In fact, he had a lot of strong words about their hypocrisy and about their legalism and their structures and their rules and how it oppressed people and how they totally missed the point of taking care of people. Uh, the story of the Good Samaritan is a great example of that. Exactly. Because who was it that passed by that, that man that was beat up laying on the, on the street? It was the religious people. He spent most of his time when he was here on this earth with the marginalized, with the oppressed, with the poor, with the disadvantaged. So if we're going to care about people the way Jesus cares about people, maybe we need to start talking to thinking about and caring about the horrible homeless crises in our, in our major cities. Maybe we want to start thinking about the billions of people who live across this world under the threat of, of terrorism. Maybe we want to think about people who are women usually and, ch and a lot of children who are caught up in the human trafficking, sex trafficking uh, all around the world. Maybe we want to talk about, think about people right here in North Carolina who are trying to find what's missing in life through drugs, sex, booze, or anything else. Maybe we want to start thinking about the people who live in the trailer park on the edge of town. Maybe we want to think about people whose needs are so great whose lives are so marginalized, who live without hope, who feel like they're helpless in the face of the phenomenal odds of life that are stacked against them. If we agape Jesus, we will care about what Jesus cares about. I believe that's the first of the two reasons why Jesus asked Peter three different times, do you love me? But there's a second reason. If we agape Jesus, we will stay on mission. We will stay on mission. Now, the answer is not quite as the uh, it's not quite apparent in the three questions. That's why we got to go back to the first of the chapter and see the answer to this. But first of all, let me ask you this question. Would any of you like to stand before Jesus and have him ask you three times, David, do you love me? David, do you love me? Do you, do you love me? Yeah, I, I, but I believe that's exactly what's happening. He said, I want you, if, if, if we agape Jesus, we will care about what Jesus cares about. Secondly, we will stay on mission. Go back to verse 1. Now, before they became disciples, what profession did most of the disciples, what profession were most of the disciples in? They were fishermen. So Simon Peter is saying to the majority of the, of the, of the uh, disciples, not all of them are here, but the majority of them are. Let's go back to what we know how to do. Let's get back. Let's, get, let's go back and get life back under control. Let's go open a new business. Now, 
you have to realize that for them to do that, they would have to go off mission from what Jesus has appointed them to do. He said, you shall be my witnesses all around the world. His, what Jesus put him on mission to do was to go and tell the world about Jesus Christ, how he died for sins and how much God loves them. But they, they, they said, this didn't work out so well. Let's go back to fishing. That we know, that we control. Had they stayed as fishermen, there's a pretty good chance you and I would not be sitting here today as Christians, as redeemed sinners. This is a very serious moment. They, are, they the disciples, are going off mission and going off calling. Now, before I get to... It sounds like I'm getting harsh on them. I don't, I, I'm not sure I blame them. Because quite honestly, I'd be discouraged too at this point if I were them. Uh, I think I might be saying just exactly what they're thinking. This didn't turn out the way I thought it would. Because for three years, they walked with the headliner. They were in the spotlight. Their expectation was that Jesus, not that he would go to the cross to bring in a spiritual kingdom, but that he was going to come and overthrow the Roman Empire, the hated Roman Empire, and bring in a social, political, economic kingdom. And in doing so, restore Israel to all of her former glory. And he would sit on the throne of David. He would be king. And guess who his cabinet was going to be? But Jesus makes the announcement. Nope. Wrong thinking, guys. The kingdom will come someday, but I'm going to the cross. I'm going to suffer. And I'm going to die. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus went to the cross. He shuddered. Uh, he suffered. And he died. And the disciples shuddered inside a locked room, scared to death, waiting any moment for the Romans or the Jews to come knocking on their door. And then they hear the news from a woman, no less. He's alive. He's risen. He's coming back. Now, can you think of how these disciples all of a sudden got excited? Happy days are here again. Here we go. Well, the plan we had and that we thought was going to uh, going to happen, now it's going to happen. He's alive. He's alive. He's going to overthrow the government. All we got, but he never showed up. And when he did, when he finally did, he showed up in his weird way, as we talked about last week. They were in an upper room. Doors locked. And Jesus didn't open the door. He didn't climb in the window. He just all of a sudden materialized in front of them. He shows them the wounds. He eats with them. And then just about as fast and as mysteriously as he came in, he's gone again. Do you think you'd be a little discouraged at this point? I mean, he died on the cross. We found out he's alive. And he was here for a second, and now he's gone again. Peter says to the rest of them, boys, I didn't think it was going to work out this way. we got to be able to control our livelihood. we got, we got to do something. Let's go back to life the way it used to be. Now, maybe these disciples are distracted by worldly stuff. I don't know. Uh, maybe they're sitting there thinking, let's open our fishing business and maybe we'll have enough money to buy food and robes again. You know, so, so they say to Peter, we'll go with you. And then they get out in the, in, in, the, in the boat in the Sea of Tiberias, which is just another word for the Dead Sea, Sea of Galilee, same word, same, same place. And they fished all night, which night is the time to fish. They threw out the nets, hauled them back in, no fish. Threw out the nets, hauled them back in, no fish. All night long, they caught nothing. Zero, zip, nada. Now, if you just take a day off from work and go fishing, getting skunks, no big deal, is it? But if this is the first day of your new business, it's huge. You know? Can you picture them working hard, fishing all night? Now, this is not fishing like you and I know it. Like I said, it's not just by casting the favorite lure that you made down in your basement and casting it out and reeling it in and casting it out. No, they're throwing the nets 
and they're water soaked, they're full of weeds and everything else. And every draw of the net brought no fish. Just think of the encouragement, of the discouragement that was growing every time an empty net was drawn back in. If you bail out on Jesus and go off mission because you think there's something better, you're going to fish all night and catch nothing. You better remember that. When you walk through the pearly gates of heaven, you'll know that you have spent your life catching nothing. Well, the text says that the morning broke, and when the morning broke and light came up, where it was enough where they could see, they saw a man sitting on the, squatting at the beach. You know, they didn't know who it was at the time. We know it was Jesus. And then this, year, this man yells out onto the, from the shore, Hey, y'all ain't caught anything, have you? How's the fishing? He says, It stinks. We fished all night and caught nothing. Well, I got a cool idea. Why don't you throw the net on the other side of the boat? And they were probably thinking, where did this bozo come from? But you know, this, you know what happened. You've read the story before. They do what he says, and the nets are full of fish. And at this point in time, John realizes that it's Jesus on the shore, and he tells Peter, it's Jesus. And G G Peter does what he always does. He puts the robes on. He goes overboard again and sloshes through the shallow water to meet Christ while he left everybody else, all his buddies, to row the boat to shore. Why would Peter jump off the boat and run to meet Jesus? Now, this is not the first time this miracle has happened. You go back to the fifth chapter of Luke, and you see this a similar miracle. Jesus is ministering to the crowd, and the crowd's gotten so large, he sees these fishermen who are in, in, in the shadows of the water. So he gets in their boat and says, row out a little bit, and then he stands in the boat and he speaks to the crowd. And when he gets finished speaking... He turns to the fishermen and he says, how's the fishing? And the fishermen say, it stinks. We've been fishing all night and caught nothing. And Jesus didn't tell them to row out a little bit deeper, cast their nets on the other side of the boat. And the Bible says that the boat was so, f even though it was the wrong time of the day to fish, the, the, the nets were so full that it began to break and the boats were so full of fish, they began to sink. And at some point in, their, in that process, Peter falls on his face before Christ and, and says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. He is so struck with Jesus' authoritative teaching, which he's so struck with the person of Jesus, whom the fish even obey, that he cries out as a repentant sinner. But Jesus responded as he always does to any repentant sinner that's, cry, that's crying out. He didn't give a word of judgment. He gave a notion of mercy. He said, follow me. He said, Peter, get up. Follow me. From now on, you're going to be fishermen of men, not fishermen of fish. In other words... I got a mission for you. I want you to go care for what I care about. I want you to go tell other people. And Luke says, immediately they left their nets, and they left their family, and they followed him. Peter, James, and John got into the people business with him. So why did Peter run to the, here in John 21, why did he jump out of the boat and run to Jesus? I believe because Jesus planned the second miracle to take him back to the, call, to the moment of his calling. Jesus wanted Peter to remember something so vividly and so compellingly real that he turn, he, he, he give up this fishing business for Christ. He wants to bring him back to that point where he was called, where he was first called. He wants to bring him back to that point where he first was told to go on mission. Remember back when you were called, when you were saved, when you were put on mission? Re remember that day. Remember when Christ was so compelling and so worthy 
And that when he came to the cross, he bathed you in forgiveness. He bathed you in his precious blood. He set you free. And forever he canceled the debt, your, your reservation in hell, and he guaranteed heaven. And you said to him, I'll give my whole life for you. Well, what changed? Did Jesus change? Have the needs of people changed? Or did we change? Go back. Remember that day. I think this was a very intentional miracle in this text, and I think it was planned completely by Jesus. The miracle was not only to put the fish in the, in the net that morning, but I believe the miracle was also to keep the fish out of the, out of the net all night long so Jesus could remind Peter of his calling. And when Peter ran to the shore, what was waiting on the shore? What does the text say? Fire. What kind of fire? Charcoal. It says a charcoal fire. Now, John's only got a few number of words to mention. So why did he specifically mention a charcoal fire? In fact, this is the only, this is, there's only two places in the New Testament that use the word charcoal. This is one. You remember what the other one was? John also used it. And we talked about it a few weeks ago, and I said, remember this, because it's going to be important. We're going to talk about it again. When Jesus was arrested, and after he went through that kangaroo court, and he was led to the praetorium, where was Peter? He was in the courtyard, was he not? What was he doing in the courtyard? He was warming his hands over a charcoal fire and denied Jesus three times. Have you ever noticed how certain smells, certain aromas bring back memories? I believe John specifically mentioned that this fire on the, on the, on the beach shore, on the lake shore, was a charcoal fire. I can't help but wonder, as Peter ran to the shore, as the aroma of this charcoal fire didn't immediately remind him of the charcoal fire which just a few days earlier he stood around denying his Lord. And Jesus is going to address that failure here. But is Jesus going to ask, why did you deny me? No, basically what Jesus is saying to him is, Peter, I know that you failed, but I desperately need you. Isn't it nice that Jesus can use our failures, our disappointments, our discouragements? If Jesus well only waited for perfect people to get involved, he'd still be doing everything all by himself. You know? And at this charcoal fire, he tells to Peter, Peter, I just need to know if you love me or not. That's what I need to know. Do you agape me? Do you agape me? Do you phileo me? Now, there's one important point here that I think is important. You may not. First of all, we know that fishermen wrote this story, wrote this, this chapter. How do we know that? Johnny will tell you. We know that because it counted the number of fish. 153 fish. And they were large fish. They didn't leave that part out, did they? That's how I know a fisherman wrote it. Yeah. A hundred and plus the two that Jesus already had. A hundred and fifty-three large fish. But when Peter gets to the boat, Jesus is already cooking some fillets. Where'd they come from? They didn't come from the net of 153 large fish. He was cooking breakfast for them. And he said he served breakfast, the fish and the bread. We've all heard about how, how important it is about the Last Supper. Well, this is the last breakfast, and I think it's equally important. And I think Jesus is making this point to Peter and to the other disciples, because he fed all of them. You thought you had to go off mission to meet your needs. You thought you had to 
go off mission just to get a little bit more money, to get a little more resources. He said, I am the resource. I am the one who carries all. I am the provider. I am the provider of all your resources. And that is an example of what how Jesus will provide for us when we stay on mission. He will not only provide for us, but he will provide generously and abundantly. 153 fish. Large <laughs> fish. Plus the two that were frying on the fire. So the next time you think about going off mission, the next time you think about compromising your integrity, or the next time you think about cheating the kingdom for a little extra cash, next time you want to quit because life got difficult, remember, you'll fish all night and you'll come back with an empty net. You will catch nothing. But Jesus will provide. You can depend on that. You can take that to the bank and deposit it. And that's exactly the point that he's making here. If you agape Jesus, you will stay on mission. Now, there's one other thing I want to talk about. Because this strikes me. What's different about the three questions that Jesus asked? And I'm not talking about the use of agape and phileo. He asked three times. What did he ask Peter three times? But one of those questions is different. <coughs> I'll give you a hint. It's the very first one. Do you love me more than, Do you love me more than these? What does that mean? My first thing, my first reaction, yours may be too. Do you love, is he asking about the other disciples? Peter, do you love me more than these other disciples? I don't think, you, th you think Peter's, I mean, Jesus is really trying to launch a love contest at this point. I mean, he's been, he's been with these disciples for three years. I think he's had it up to his neck with their competitive spirits about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, who's going to get to sit on the right, who's going to get to sit on the left. I think he's had so much, see, sick and tired of all their comp competition, especially it seems between Peter and John, that he, they, he's not ready to launch another competition. So what else could he be talking about? Peter, do you love me more than these? What else could it be if it's not the other disciples? What else was there? 153 <laughs> slimy, scaly fish. Large fish. And Jesus is asking, and I believe this is what he means, Peter, do you love me more than these fish? Because those fish represent Peter going off mission. I think Peter, I mean, Jesus would ask us exactly the same question. David, do you love me more than these? Now, I don't know what your fish is. I don't know what tempts you to go off mission or to go off calling. I don't know what it is, but I know that sometimes we all get caught up with ourselves or and we get caught up with the needs of the losers and the marginalized and the oppressed and the hopeless won't even cross our minds. All I know is the problem, whatever your fish is, the problem is the fish. It's the fish that either take us off or keeps us off mission. So I want to ask you a question that I don't want you to answer me, but I want you to answer between you and God. You can include your husband and wife too. What is your fish? Are they your own dreams? Your desire for comfort? Is it some sin that you've chosen over the fullness of Jesus Christ? Whatever it is, Jesus wants to know, do you love me more than these? If you love me, you will care about what I care about. If you love me, you will stay on mission. Do you agape me? Now, I'd like to believe that God would walk into all of our hearts this very moment, just like he always does, push all of that stuff away, get past everything, and go straight for our heart. And the question I want to leave you with, when he's standing 
at your heart. Does he see a door standing wide open saying, come in, Jesus? A heart that's beating with his passion? Or does he see a heart that has a closed door with a sign nailed to it saying, gone fishing? If you agape me, you will care about what I care about. And you will stay on mission. Do you love me? Let's close. Father God, in the stillness of the moment that we hear your voice saying to us, asking us, do you love me? And Father, my prayer is that we all can answer, yes, Lord, you know we agape you. But is that true? So Lord, show us our heart right now. Not the way we hope it is, not the way we think it is, but show us our heart as it really is, as you see it. Lord, are we putting fish in front of you? Do we say that we love you, Lord, but yet we don't put your people first? We don't put your cares first. Are we all talk? Or are we putting our love into action to show to you that we love you? And then by loving one another, your word says that we will prove to the world that we are your disciples. It's all about love. And it begins with our love for you. Because until we love you completely, totally, we cannot and will not love other people. So right now, Lord, and throughout the night until we are completely in tune with you, show us our heart. And may we make whatever adjustments we need to make to join you on mission and love the people that you died for. For this is our prayer and we know it is your will. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.